The closed door attorney client session is now concluded and the board has returned to open session. In the closed session, we discuss possible settlement negotiations and or strategy related to litigation expenditures. Dear, your motion to adjourn the AC session. Motion by Dr. Robbins is seconded by Mrs. Whitfield. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. We'll now move on to our public portion of the meetings today, beginning with a workshop. The workshop for April 21st, 2021 is now called to order at 3.56 p.m. Let the record show we have quorum with all seven board members in attendance. Also joining us on our dais is Superintendent Dr. Donald Fanoy and joining us here our General Counsel Sean Bernard, Inspector General Teresa Michael, and Board Clerk Carol Bass. Senior staff members will join us periodically as directed by the Superintendent. Viewers and listeners can access the meeting today by either watching on Comcast channels 234 and 235, UVerse channel 99, or by using the YouTube link on our webpage at palmbeachschools.org. We also offer a listening only option which the public can access by calling 561-357-5900 or toll free at 1-866-930-7015. The meeting ID is 1561-880-1124, pound sign. This meeting is being transcribed by a closed captioner, so please remember to speak at a reasonable pace. I'll now turn the workshop over to Dr. Fenoy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, I'll turn over the uh, first and only workshop from the day, Student Academic Support Plan Summer Programming, uh, to our Deputy Superintendent, Keith Oswald, and our Chief Academic Officer, Dr. Glenda Sheffield. Thank you, Dr. Fenoy, and good afternoon, school board members. We're excited to talk to you today with an update on our Student Academic Support Plan. Our Student Academic Support Plan really goes to the heart of our mission and vision. We're working to ensure each of our students reach their highest potential. In particular, our plan really goes through that lens of equity where we're focusing on the, our students who are most in need. <clears throat> Back in February, we met with the school board where we first uh, unveiled the student academic support plan. What we had heard from our board members is how are we going to be addressing the unfinished learning that has occurred in many of our students. At that workshop, we provided an, a data update really going deep into showing exactly how much unfinished learning has occurred in both literacy as well as mathematics, seeing bigger losses in mathematics. We agreed at that point that we would come back to the board with an update around what we were going to do this summer. And we said we'd come back to you in May, so we're slightly ahead. So a lot of today's workshop will really unpack our summer programs that are planned uh, for the month of June and July. And then later this summer, I know Mr. Burke has given some updates to the board around the ESSER dollars and our approach to student academic support. We will provide a deeper update of the plans for the school district moving forward later on uh, in the summer. That would kick off in August. Again, when we talk about the student academic support plan, what are we talking about? So we know that prior to COVID, we talked about back in February, that disparities existed that have only been exasperated due to trying to educate students in the environment that has occurred over the course of this last year. At the same time that this has been quite challenging for us as a school district, at the same time it brings out an opportunity for us to really re to recalibrate our system and our approach to addressing and ensuring that all of our students are meeting their fullest potential. And we're really accomplishing that through uh, a cross collaboration of our district departments and really looking at our processes and how we address student support. And under the umbrella of multi-tiered systems of support, MTSS, this is not new to the board, we've come to you before on this. This is not only through summer school programs, but we're also addressing unfinished learning through core instruction. So the board, we've talked to you before about the adoption of literacy and our approach to ensuring that core instruction, what students receive um, every single day um, while they're in school, that it's the best it can be with the best materials, the best instruction, but in addition, what the student academic support plan addresses are those areas where students need additional time um, from supplemental and intensive supports. Uh, in addition, I, I do wanna mention last week, the executive order that came out from the Department of Education and our com commissioner. This student academic support plan directly uh, ties to what is being asked by the Department of Education to ensure that the districts are focusing in on students who are most need of support. 
And what we agreed back in February is that our deliverables around our phase one. So currently we're in phase one back in August, we'll kick off for phase two, is that we would look at our process around multi-tiered systems of support, school-based teams, looking at our interventions that we are putting in front of students, making sure process as well as intervention are the best that they can be. So we've been working on that. In addition, we've been delivering on our targeted tutorials. So when we left you back in May, um, we provided $2 million in targeted tutorials to our schools, and those dollars followed the students who are most in need. And then today, what we're gonna unpack with you is really about the summer program that we said we would come back to you, and Dr. Sheffield will be going in detail around those areas in a moment. When we look at the dollars that are being spent and supported um, for our SAS program, it's roughly about $16 million. So uh, thanks to working closely with Mr. Burke, Ms. Canoes, we were able to identify an additional $10 million. In addition, we're leveraging the resources that we currently put in place when it comes to everything from the target tutorials, but our summer programs. So we're very excited. Um, and uh, the grand finale will be coming here shortly with Dr. Sheffield talking about those programs and the students that we will be targeting for this summer. And our approach to this work is really following the research and uh, through a number of different organizations, Council of Great City Schools, ERS, EdTrust, as well as many others have been publishing some approaches and giving some guidance to school districts and how they design student academic support when addressing unfinished learning. And so we, we've linked some uh, documents um, to some of the work and what we're following here as a district. Again, when you look at all these documents, equity is a key piece to that and that ensuring that districts are in, in schools are focusing on the students who are most in need. And uh, it definitely, we are doing that in our approach and we shared some of that data with the board in the past. Also that we're providing um, not just tutoring, but really targeted tutorials that are following the research of an effective tutorial lesson. That there's good, strong relationships built not only uh, during a school day, but in a tutoring lesson. That the intervention is the right intervention. And that the expanded learning time that is uh, really non-negotiable in a lot of the different research. So just that we know that some students will need more time, whether that's during the school day, before school, after school, Saturdays, et cetera. And, and what's critical is the content. So uh, prioritizing content, you know, uh, Council of Great City Schools working with student achievement partners really talked a lot about this around looking at the standards, examining uh, the materials that we're using and putting in front of our students that the best materials to be using. And then are we measuring our success in the learning that is occurring based on these prior prioritization areas? And we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. So uh, our goals with the Summer Acceleration Academies is to leverage the federal dollars that we've received, um, as well as looking at the resources that it, uh, we currently exist in the school district to identify and support the students who are most in need that have the greatest unfinished learning. And then really, you know, what we heard with the board provide a real robust experience for our students this summer, that it's not just strictly about academics and Dr. Sheffield will speak to that uh, momentarily around how a real design around those particular programs. Um, and then finally the goal is to ensure that uh, the students that are going to these programs are more prepared for the next school year. So this, uh, in our design um, and how much we could actually pull off this summer, one of the things that we talked about with the board in the past is would we have the workforce who would want to work with the instructional staff? We know that uh, our teachers are tired. It's been a very challenging year for them and uh, many people are looking for some time off. So we did do a survey um, to our instructional staff we had about over 2,500 of our staff respond and to the survey and roughly a little less than 50% indicated that they would be interested in working this summer. Some of those uh, potentially looked at potentially working half the summer, so we are being flexible, uh, approximately four weeks of summer school, so some might work two weeks on, two weeks off. Um, so we will give that flexibility to schools as well. And when you look across levels, um, it's relatively split 
Um, so we're confident with what we're gonna present to you today that we will be able to staff that. Um, it will be, be tight. We do have our special education programs and others that we wanna share our priority as well. So, but with the teachers who have expressed interest, we feel confident that we'll be able to do that. And in addition, we've been working closely with CTA in our approach. We've been, uh, Dr. Sheffield and I have been meeting with them uh, uh, bi-weekly, giving updates and collaborate, collaborating throughout this process. Uh, so now the really exciting part that Dr. Sheffield gets to do is really talk about the programs. Yes, yeah, so good afternoon board members and Dr. Fenoy. Um, um, this is definitely really exciting for us as Ms. Oswald indicated when we came back earlier and we talked about um, phase one of this academic support plan and it was around the framework and what was the framework that we were gonna be utilizing and talked about the fidelity and it didn't matter what kind of resources but the fidelity of our implementation. And we made a commitment that we were going to dig a little deeper into phase one and talk about what is it that we can do to help mitigate some of the instructional losses that our students were occurring um, that have encountered um, within this past year and a half. So this is the second part of that phase one, which is talking about uh, many of the programs in which we're gonna be doing this summer to try to assist our students, our families, um, in regarding to leveraging some of those um, instructional laws that our students encountered. And what we do know in talking about this summer and creating these instructional programs to help mitigate some of the losses is that this work is going to continue and then that will be part two, um, excuse me, I should say phase two of this student academic support plan. So the work that we're going to continue to do over this summer, um, I'm just going to go through um, the bulleted items here. As we go through this, you're gonna get an overview of each of those programs. Um, so the first program that I will talk about in our academies are running from June 28th through July 22nd. So our students will have, a, students that are participating will have a week off uh, once we're at the end of this academic year, then they will have a week off before starting the new upcoming um, year. So the first program that we have is our VPK, VPK program. This is for our four-year-old students, those families that did not use their voucher, their VPK voucher during the academic year. Right now, what we have and changes are still coming and updates are coming from the state as it pertains to our VPK program. So VPK, what we have right now is a hub and that hub for VPK is Village Academy. And notice what I'm saying is that we realize that with VPK, we're looking at the numbers as it's coming in and if there are adjustments and so forth that needs to be made based on the areas and the location and what's happening and we have the numbers, then of course with MJ Steele, Diana um, Fetterman and myself, we will come together then talk about how we're making sure that the students are being serving, ser that we're servicing our VPK students if the numbers are indeed there. But right now we do have a hub um, for the district, which will be Village Academy. We also um, are excited about within our elementary um, area, we have a rising first, second, and third grade academy that we will be having. We will also be continuing with our expanded SRA program. That's our summer reading academy that we have each year for our third grade students. I will dig a little deeper into explaining again each of these programs and their function. For middle school, we're gonna be having um, what is called a preparing for success. It's for our rising sixth graders. Um, these are the students that are currently sitting in their, middle, um, in their elementary school in fifth grade. And also in middle school, we have what we have always have every summer is our credit recovery program, and then our jump start to high school program. Those are the last two uh, programs that we have every summer, but I'm just excited about the addition that we are adding for our middle school students, which is that um, program for our incoming sixth graders. And as we move down to high school, we, in high school we have what is called a graduation support, and that's primarily starting with our seniors, and as the space open up, we will be inviting um, our juniors, meaning the cohort for the class of 2022. And another program that we have every summer, um, which is our ESY, our ESOL, and then our migrant programs, these programs will continue to be operating this summer as well. But those particular programs are programs that we've had every summer. So as I indicated, as I go through the slides, you're gonna hear me repeat some of the programs, but it's going to give you more insight in regards to how we are determining what students 
will attend what particular program. For our VPK, our VPK, our targeted areas, of course, as I indicated, is for our four-year-old students, those students and families that did not use the voucher during this academic year. And our area of target, and I should say our purpose, um, for this program will be around their kindergarten readiness skills. And then when we go down to that K-2 program that I talked about earlier, which is new for us, that rising um, first, second, third grade program, um, which will be at our elementary cluster sites. And you can see the time there is from 8.30 to 2.30. And around that particular area, our focus is gonna be on literacy and math. And as I said, that our SRA, which is our summer reading academy that we've had every year for our third grade students that did not do well on their state assessment, we're continuing with our SRA program. And this is a program that we had planned and we, were, we had started with planning this out prior to the current executive order even coming because we are committed here in this district to work alongside with our students and our families in mitigating these instructional losses. In this particular program, our purpose was around, again, on the literacy and moving our students on to first, um, excuse me, to fourth grade. And the last one on this particular slide is around our ESY, our ESOL, and our migrant programs. And you have the dates there as well. Um, in this particular pro these particular programs, too, are going to be going from 8.30 to 2.30, and they're going to be on our various cluster sites. And for these particular programs, it's going to be driven by their IEP goals and their language development. Now I'm going to just take you through, and I'm going to slow down a little bit. It's just going to take you through in regards to our purpose, our why, because as the team, we were developing and we were truly talking in regards to what we felt the greater needs were, because this was not something um, that was done in isolation um, in working with, you know, teaching and learning, working with assessments, all the various departments, um, the principal supervisors, um, engaging input in regards to what the greater needs were. So for our K-2 program, for our K-2 program, which is for our rising first, second, and third grade students, um, you could see the data that we have utilized in identifying the students that will be participating is that we looked at our iReady data, those students that were in the lowest 20 percentile, and we're and right now we are looking at at approximately 6,700 students that filled within that category. Now, when we look and I talk about the numbers within these programs, these are our targeted numbers. What's being provided to us? We are we have identified these students. We'll be reaching out to the families, working with the families, and trying to get them to um, participate and getting our families to understand the intended purpose, what is our goal. And the goal for this particular program here, as you could see, is just to continue engaging our um, students in the instructional mythologies and so forth, in literacy and math. And most important, um, the work that the team has done was around project-based learning, STEM, STEAM, PE, art, music, and some work around our social and emotional learning. And those pieces are just so important because we hear it loud and clear. When the board talked in regards to the work that we were going to be doing with our students over the summer, do not allow it to be just be a sit and get. Give our students some hands-on experience and some exposure. So we are trying to do a well-rounded program for our students and, most, and also for our teachers that are participating. And all of our programs will be face-to-face, -face, with one exception for one of our programs, and I will explain that particular pro program to you um, shortly. And with all of the programs that I go through and explaining to you, as you see in this last bullet, our students with disability and our ELL students, these students will participate in all of the programs that I'm talking to you about, um, via their inclusion model and where they're identified. And we're gonna rely very heavy on Mr. McCormick and um, Mr. Walker because we know with our Students with disabilities and with our ELL students, their individual educational plans are going to help drive the appropriate placement for them over the summer. And then when we get to our SRA, because I know it probably was a little confusing when I talked earlier about the, this initial program around the K, you know, our rising first, second, and third graders, 
Well, this particular SRA reading program here, excuse me, for third grade, this particular program is targeting the third grade students that would have been a part of our traditional SRA Academy based on their FSA score and they needed to meet good cause exemptions for promotion to fourth grade. So there is a difference. And what we have done in terms of identifying the students that will participate in this particular program is that we're looking at their winter diagnostic scores. And we did, um, we gave winter diagnostics um, this past winter um, in December, January, and you know, we try to you know, provide that assessment that was very closely aligned to how they were going to be assessed on, state on, on their state assessment. Parents were bringing the students onto the campuses. Um, they were being assessed. We were getting the data. We were utilizing the data to help drive teaching and learning, to drill down with the tutorials that our students are participating in now. So in doing such, um, we've identified approximately 3,000 students that where their winter diagnostic scores came back and predicted them a level one in reading. So, and we're still gonna go through the good cause promotion in terms of completing of their good cause portfolios and all of those pieces and so forth. And again, this particular program is going to be face-to-face. -face. Um, it's gonna be at our various elementary cluster sites. All of our sites have been identified. And as I indicated earlier, around our students with disabilities and our ELL students, these students will participate again in this program with the inclusion model, but their individual educational plan is going to drive the placement of the program that's most appropriate for them. And as we move on to our middle school, our middle school transition program um, is for our rising sixth graders. This is brand new. Um, it's our students, our fifth graders that are currently sitting there at their elementary campus. These students will go on to their assigned middle school. And you're gonna see in a minute the data that we would use to identify the students that will participate in this particular program. Our middle school program, this particular program will go from 730 to 12.30 on Monday through Thursday. And then we were going to also have our middle school course recovery. This program is not too new to us. This is a program that we run every summer. This is a program that um, our principals actually have running on their campus throughout the duration of the year. And this is to help our students that may be missing some quality points to help them being promoted on to the next grade level. And all of you are familiar with our Jumpstart program because you do come out to the celebration of our students that we have each summer that participate in this program. Our Jumpstart program is the program that we house on our high school campuses. On one high school campus, we have not yet decided which campus it will be held on. Um, but this program is for our seventh grade students. Our seventh grade students that may be over age or have had two retentions thus or so forth and the students must successfully complete the program. And if they successfully complete the program, these students will go with a cohort and they will transition on to high school and we track them through, throughout the duration. And then also on our middle school slide at the bottom here is a program that we have every year. It's our ESY and our, our ESY, our ESOL and our migrant programs. These programs are programs that the state fund for us each year. Um, we are going to continue with it and they will be on our high school cluster sites and you see the time there and the students that are participating as I've been saying throughout will be identified based on um, their individual educational plan and their needs and that's again where we work very closely with Mr. McCormick and Ms. Owaka. And then in transitioning, and this is the program that I talked about our fifth grade students, our current fifth grade students transitioning to middle school, um, having an opportunity, this is brand new for us. I was really excited uh, when the team was meeting and I mentioned to Mr. Oswald and asked about, let's think about our fifth grade students transitioning onto middle school and looking at literacy. And he was really excited and we dug a little deeper and said, well, let's look at the data, let the data drive the decision here. And you can see that when we pull the data right now, we have about 3,100 um, students that falls into the category in terms of would need some remediation there and that intense instruction um, and some support. Our fifth grade students coming on to middle school 
And these are the students, and this is what we've done. What we did in identifying the students, we went back, we looked at their previous FSA score. We know they did not have a score in 2020, so we had to go back and look at their 19 score. There, we looked at their 19 score and then we, the FSA, and we also looked at their current winter diagnostic score. And then we looked to see if they were a level one or a level two on ELA and math. And that's how we identified the students for this particular um, academy here that we will be running. And again, it is face-to-face, -face, and the students will go on to their assigned middle school campus that they will transition to once leaving fifth grade. Our students with disability in ELL, again, will have an opportunity to participate based on their individual educational plan, what's most appropriate. And then with our middle school recovery, I know when you look at the middle school recovery and you see 2,500, approximately 2,500 students there, you're probably saying that's a lot of students. It is a lot. But remember what I said earlier? Our middle school recovery program is not a program that our principals wait to add onto their campus during the summer to help our students, those that may be lacking quality points. This program runs on our campuses all year long. So our middle school program principals, they are monitoring, they are tracking, and they have students that are currently participating. So I'm sure this number will go down um, significantly. And these will be, we'll start with our eighth grade students, and as the space open up and we are successful with our eighth grade students, we will then go down to our seventh grade students and, and just keep going down. Our goal again is to work with our students and their families. This program also is face-to-face. -face. Um, students will uh, you know, continue on the campus in which they are currently enrolled. And our ESC and our ELL students, again, will have an opportunity to participate. And I talked earlier around our Jump Start to High School program. This was the program for our seventh grade students that may have been over age or have two or more um, retention. And this is a program that we've ran for many years here in the district. It's held on one comprehensive high school campus. Um, if the students successfully complete this program, the students will matriculate to ninth grade and they are placed in a cohort and these students are monitored and they're continuing to receive the support to ensure success once they get onto the high school campus. This particular program here, it is face to face. But remember what I said that um, all programs are face to face, but this particular program is face to face Monday through Thursday. Because of statue and there are so many hours the students must attend, they will have to attend on Friday, but their Friday instruction will be through virtual learning, will be distance. So they will be four days face-to-face, -face, and then on Friday it will be virtual. And this particular program here also, again, because of the hours and the mandate, will extend out in an additional week. I start what they're one week early or later. <laughs> and then we have our... Um, High school summer academies. Our high school summer academies, what we're doing this year, um, we have an academy that we're putting on called Graduation Support, giving our seniors a priority. And this program is going to take place on all of our high school campuses from 7.30 to 12.30. And what we're doing with this particular program here, our, our purpose is to ensure graduation um, success and helping our students meet all of their graduation requirements and then we will also include um, driver's ed onto our various cluster sites. And again, with high school, um, along with high schools, you're gonna have your ESY, your ESOL, and your migrant programs for your high school students as well on the various cluster sites. And the students that are participating in that particular program is going to um, be based on their individual educational plan. And when we talk about and when we talk about our graduation support academy on our high school campuses, um, right now when you see that number of the 40, right at 4,800 students um, that have been identified, we know that this number here as well will um, decrease significantly. Um, we're continuing to work with our students and you know we talked about the re-engagement and we were trying to identify and work with our students and so forth. We're continuing to work with our students. This is another way in which we're working with our students and making certain that we are providing them an opportunity. Those that have not met all the requirements by their spring 
to graduate in the spring, they will have an opportunity to continue to meet those graduation requirements by summer to where they can participate in our summer graduation ceremony. And then once we have met with our seniors and the numbers are going down, as I indicated, we will then invite our juniors, which are cohorts for the class of 22. And then here, this is a program that we've ran every summer. Um, it's the summer program for our ELL and our migrant students. And you will see the target audience here. And the target audience is for all levels, our elementary, our middle, and our high school, um, high school students. And these particular programs for our ELL and our migrant students will be face-to-face. -face. We have the various cluster sites. And we're going to be focusing on the language development, of course, and an increased academic skills in the areas of literacy and math for the students that are participating. And then this is another program that we ran, um, that we run every summer as well, which would not be new to you. Um, our ESY we refer it to, and this particular program, you know, is for our um, ESE students, and the target area here is for our IEP teams, and they're the ones that would have recommended the services that our students would need and their goals um, that we should be working on for the summer with for the participating students. And then driver's education, I'm sure our families are excited to see us uh, offering driver's education on some of our campuses. This is going to allow the students to receive a half credit. And on offering the driver's education course this summer, it's going to be important and we are putting the word out there that there is no um, in-car driving because some of our students are, you know, they're also interested in that behind the wheel experience as well, but we're gonna offer the course, but there's no in-car driving. However, students will take the drug and alcohol exam and the learner's permit exam for free um, during this course. And again, it is face to face. And I'm just excited that with all the programs that I have shared with you, um, that our students will not have to worry about transportation. If mom and dad, if they're working and they're not able to get them there if they prefer to drop them off or pick them up, transportation would not be a barrier. We've worked with Ms. Paul and that team to all students that have been identified um, to participate in these academies. It will be bus transportation provided. Um, students will be identified in our database, SIS, um, under the summer school tab. Parents, because we're putting it all in SIS, that's going to allow our parents an opportunity to log in like they will do during the academic year once we're all set and ready to go to receive the bus transportation route. And then also, you know, we're excited that we're not just bringing our students in and you could see some of it along days. We're gonna be able to provide our students with breakfast and lunch um, provided free to all participating students. Um, all students, um, all summer school sites will be open on Thursdays for grab and go meal distributions. And during that time, seven days worth of breakfast and lunch will be provided for those students that are not attending um, a summer school program or a camp. And our school nurses, um, we just finished up, um, you know, another call today. I have to definitely thank, you know, Mr. Boggess for working with us and leading this team for Mr. Oswell and myself. Around with our school nurses, we've been in collaboration um, with the healthcare district. Healthcare district is working Right now, our legal team is working with the healthcare legal team and working a contract up to where for the nurses that we've identified, and I think we've identified right at about 30 nurses that are looking forward to working with us over the summer. That will not cover all of the sites per se because we have more than 30 sites. So we will be working, uh, Mr. Oswald and myself, and looking at the highest needs and determining how we are going to be allocating um, those nurses and we will also have floating nurses as well. But it was important for us to just make certain that um, we really worked, you know, with the healthcare district, collaborated with them. <clears throat> Mr. Burke has been on with us and I think today we came to um, the financial agreement in regards to what it will look like and the immediate needs and legal, both legal teams now are working through the nursing contract for summer. And as I went through all of those programs in regards to what we're looking to do with our students, our families, um, in mitigating some of the instructional losses this summer, I know it was a lot, but I do want to assure the board 
that when we talk about and looking at the programs that we have outlined, understanding that when we went to the table, we utilized the data to help with our decision making and knowing that um, it's going to take a lot more and we are prepared for this. And at the same time, it was important for us to talk about what are you going to use to, major, to measure the success, to know if it's working or if it's not working. So at this time, uh, Mr. Oswald are gonna go, he will go over some of the components, what we're gonna be utilizing as a team to talk about measuring the success of the work that we're gonna be doing this summer and trying to mitigate some of the instructional losses. Thank you, Dr. Chef. Thank you, Dr. Sheffield. Never have I seen how many dollars that we're actually putting into a summer learning program like we are this summer. You can see from what Dr. Sheffield went over, we're covering the gamut from K-12 around providing transportation, school food service. So it's critical that we are holding ourselves accountable and measuring our success. What we're learning throughout um, from February forward through this summer is gonna help really shape our approach when we go into next summer. So measuring that success from everything from the participation, measuring the actual improvement and that unfinished learning and how much learning has actually occurred from the summer programs. How many students are now meeting student progression and being able to be promoted to the next grade level. Also, uh, some of the things that are on in here, looking at the students, did they come and participate? Did they find it engaging um, and find a robust experience um, to, to really get them excited about learning? Um, and, and, then, and then obviously most important, graduation, right? So a lot came out around the executive order last week around graduation and not tying uh, the actual diploma to the FSA uh, or the EOC result. However, schools and school districts are still being held accountable that we have a comparable level of performance that we can ensure that our students are graduating with a standard high school diploma as identified by state statute. And we're providing guidance to our schools on that piece. And those are all gonna be some of the measurements that we look as we move forward in the, uh, this particular summer. Again, we're slightly ahead uh, with our update around phase one. And as we talked about, we'll be coming back to the board for phase two this summer. Um, we'll also provide just an update uh, around what has happened this particular summer. The targeted tutorials will continue to be going on up through June 18th that our schools have been using those $2 million on, um, as well as planning and recruiting those students. All the numbers that Dr. Sheffield uh, went over, we're gonna continue to provide updates um, uh, to our schools on those students who are most in need of support. Again, very excited about the, uh, the number of programs and what we're providing um, for our students this summer. And at this time, I'll turn it back over to the superintendent and the chair for questions that they may have, the board may have. Superintendent, do you have anything? No, sir, I have no questions. Ms. Brill and then uh, Mrs. Whitfield. And thank Sanders. you, and thank you for your presentation. I do have a few questions, but they're pretty brief. So my first question, I know that you shared information on the number of teachers that were willing to work in the summer, but my question is, do we have agreement with our bargaining units for the work that we're going, you know, because we're talking about these programs, do we have, the, do we have agreements for this staffing yet? Yes, yeah, so one of the things that we've been working through was really, um, uh, was the pay. And so we are paying um, teachers their hourly rate. Um, and that's also a lot lining contracts. So that was one of the big pieces that we are sure that they're getting their hourly rate and any of the working conditions we continue to work with. We have another update meeting tomorrow afternoon with yeah. Justin. But it, you know, it's beyond just the teachers. We're talking about food service. We're talking about bus drivers. We're talking about maintenance. So yeah, I'm, I got to respond to that, Ms. Brill. We, we have met with SAU and I have another meeting, but is we're really just following the same contractual pieces we do every summer. And so all of that is in alignment. Because I'm just concerned about the staffing. Thank you. Um, and if I may continue. So you answered my question about transportation and food service. Um, is aftercare available for the families that send their children? Because many are working. We don't have um, aftercare, but we do have um, summer camp that Ms. Um, Kawana Howell, our aftercare director, we will be running some, some, some of our summer camps. Um, so I can talk with Mrs. Howe to see what would that look like um, if we have students that are participating um, 
during our program to when they get out early, what is the likelihood or is it available? I would have to talk with Mrs. Howe to see because some of these grants are very strict in regards to the students must be participating the entire time. So I would need to follow up with Mrs. And I Howe. Had, I had touch base because typically they do collaborate so that when a student ends, exits one program, they go into the other uh, at the 2.30 time. So that will be available as well. Um, we're also collaborating with some external partners around that uh, uh, particular issue as well. Thank you. May I keep going? I just have a couple more. So um, also, so thank you for that. Um, the, when you talk about the ESY and ESOL students, um, that, you know, I'm, I'm glad Dr. Sheffield that you, that you do go into that IEP goals may not necessitate a cluster site, but when you say that the IEP will drive the placement that's most appropriate for them, I just want to make sure that it's not staff driven, that we are co collaborating with our parents of the ESOL students and the ESC students um, to make sure that they understand or that they have input um, into which programs are, are selected for their children. So noted. Okay, and then finally, my last one is the driver's education piece. I know that um, there's no in-car driving, but I remember years ago, I'm sure Mrs. Andrews will remember as well, um, that we had an issue because driver's ed was not equitably distributed around the district. So we want to make sure as we talk about equity in our workshops, um, I know you said it's available at some schools. Let's make sure that we're not excluding anybody, please. And that's it for me. Thank you. Mrs. Whitfield and then Mrs. Andrews. Thank you. Um, I have a, a few as well. Um, first of all, thank you so much for all this work. I know you guys have put a lot of time into this um, and I'm just so grateful that we have such a robust program going into summer school considering uh, the struggles that we're having. Um, first question I had is um, of all those kids that you have identified, how many of them usually come or how many do you expect will actually show up? A typically our return rate has been roughly 30 to 40 percent. So so the, the way that we do this is the, the staff, the principal, the guidance counselor, someone at the school approaches the parents and lets them know that we would like them to attend. Is that how it works usually? Yeah, so we've been engaging with all, so uh, all the, there's many departments, almost every department touches summer school because it's just starting summer, summer back up. Um, so we've been working through all those processes. We just held a meeting yesterday with our summer school administrators around that recruitment piece. We uh, also worked with our principals last week around their actual, they received their list of identified students to begin recruitment. We'll be providing a toolkit to those schools, letters to invite them, making those phone calls um, for them to attend. So now that part, the outreach is happening at this time. And so if you're a parent who wants your child to go to summer school, but they haven't been identified, can they go as well? Or is there a space for them to go? Um, so right now we're looking, trying to drive the numbers based on those with the greatest needs. We are working where if someone falls in with a need that has not been identified. So for example, in grade four, um, and based on the executive order, some of those students who may be greatly at risk, we're working through some of those uh, nuances to see where we can uh, possibly serve those students as well um, that are also in need. I mean, Again, I've just heard from yeah. some parents, even one last night, who was telling me their kid has been doing such a, uh, having such a struggle this year, and so they're not achieving at the level that the parent expects them to. They may be passing according to us, but um, I know that, you know, the, the struggle is very real for what these kids have gone through this year. Um, so if there are extra spaces, I think we should make them available um, for anybody who wants to attend if we have, if the funding aligns, because um, I think some families would very much like to, you know, get that extra boost because we want the children to be successful, not just pass, right? So sure. if it's possible, if we have, if only 30 or 40% are showing up, maybe there's extra spaces available. Um, and then I'm really glad you're doing the transportation piece. Um, one thing that I was concerned about though is that the jump start you're looking at doing it at just one high school um and i guess you've always do it at just one high school uh, but it's always been at just one high school and yeah. this has been for years and it's been very very successful and we've talked about in regards to looking at the um some other campuses but it's just been so successful um to where it's one of those things that we're so <laughs> you know it's just it worked so well um and we have that team all set and ready to go 
And mm -hmm. based on the numbers that we have, we think we're still going to be able to accommodate when we're looking, we're not looking at a greater influx of students. You don't um, have a difficulty with people on the far ends of the county not wanting to come no, um, that distance? No, absolutely not. We provide transportation. Yeah, I'm just worried it's like a two hour commute for them for some of these kids to be picked this, up. This section program has a higher attendance rate. We get almost every student um, really? attending. Um, the bonding that goes on with these students, um, the, the teachers who are supporting that we really um, centrally recruit to find the best of the best because we're we're asking a lot of the student as well as the teacher. We're prioritizing content um, and time. Uh, so it's pretty intense program. But then, you know, what those students are able to achieve if they success are successful is to go on to high school. So um, the attendance um, has been high. Um, they've been showing up because they know um, what the possibility is, what is to move that on to high school. There's a there's a lot of motivation there. The efficacy to show up. is yeah. there. Okay. Definitely. That's really good. Um, and then the last question I had was about VPK. Um, I saw you only have one site for that as well um, at Village Academy. Obviously, there's probably some interest in the rest of the county as well. But how do you assess interest? I know you said you'd look at new sites if there was interest, but how do you find out if someone's interested in VPK? Well, um Summer school. With MJ Steele, our um, director for early childhood, is the one that leads up our VPK, and the registration is going on now. So she, along with uh, Ms. Fetterman, we're monitoring it very, very um, close, very closely, because um, we just learned this past week that with the VPK, with very strict guidelines, that they have had to um, have an, an average for 30 days, um, 30, 300 hours. So 300 hours, is, it's massive. It was also almost going to be like, say, an eight to five, and they just reduced it this past week to 200. So VPK right now, based on the numbers that we have, we just have it at the hub at Village Academy. But to open up additional sites, we're going to have to have the numbers that's going to adjust for such. Um, as much as we would love to see a site in each of the areas, we could not open up a VPK, a VPK site in each area, say, for two or three students you know because of the funding costs and so forth but we are definitely monitoring it very closely what was important to us is to make certain that we had a vpk hub to start planning that's great and most most popular vpk is during the school year yeah so very few choose the summer program so it's usually not a very popular program and we also closely work with elc on the location based on where they see those certificates are Okay, can I ask two more questions, really, really fast ones? Um, I know I'm pushing it here, but um, do principals have any um, latitude to do anything outside of what you're doing, or is this the, the final bit of what they're doing at the schools? Yeah, there's a number of projects, uh, one-offs, if we will, for lack of a better word, that, uh, that will be happening in some of our campuses. Some of our schools um, have additional funding from their title dollars. Some have some SIG dollars, and they're gonna be targeting some additional uh, potential programs. Um, uh, Dr. Sheffield's been working closely with some um, external providers and, and providing some support. So there will be some other programs outside of what is being owned centrally. This is like the core, but there's the core, other things yeah. out there. Okay. And then will we have Palm Beach Virtual? If anybody is interested in doing virtual over the summer, will that be expanded enough for people to use it over the summer? Or is it not starting until next fall? really in that the expanded next, version that will be next fall the all the conversation around with palm beach virtual now i just met with the team again um today um to where we're talking about the leveraging of palm beach virtual and what that's going to look like but it's all around our fall okay all right thank you guys so much i appreciate it dr robinson and mrs mcquinn okay it's miss andrews and mr barbieri i'm next I'm sorry, Ms. Sanders, you were next. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Oswald and Dr. Sheffield for a lot of great work here. And I have some of the same kinds of questions that you've already heard. And I'm worried about the teachers. I know you've done a, a big survey and you think you have the teachers. I don't know how you're actually identifying those teachers who can really do the job this summer. I mean, everybody may not be cut out for every area. So, so hopefully you're not gonna be utilizing out of field teachers, that you're gonna be looking for high performing teachers and how are you assessing this pool of teachers that you're gonna be using based on uh, credentials in the sense of uh, proven student achievement for these children who are suffering? How, how have you actually identified that group other than just through the survey of who wants to teach? 
also including the survey, we did look at certification was an issue. Would we have enough who were in the elementary level literacy or math um, certified? So that's definitely an area when they look at performance, so going through that job application, looking for those highly uh, effective teachers are gonna be critical. This is gonna be, you articulated well, the challenge that we're gonna have, is there enough supply there? And then of that, um, you know, we wanna get that, you know, the highest uh, performing teachers. So we're looking at previous track records and HR is working closely with our summer school administrators to find those with the most proven track record. Um, uh, one of the challenges um, that we've had in the past is the reading endorsement based on the executive order. Um, that will hopefully expand where maybe someone doesn't have the, uh, the endorsement, however, they are pretty highly effective in working with students. Um, so that will hopefully open up the pool to, to more teachers as well. Are and, you working with the... And I'm sorry, Ms. Angels, I did want to add on to that um, because what we are also doing to your point is that the extensive PD that we will be providing for all of our teachers around um, having that growth mindset and then those accelerated strategies and making certain that they understand um, what embedding those strategies look like. So we also will be having extensive PD going on during the summer for our teachers. Are you working with the region superintendents uh, and the principals and building that cadre that you're going to use? I know the number sounds great, but they know exactly who can actually move student ach achievement within their schools and who can make it happen. We're talking about kids who've been left behind and we know how serious this is. And so are you, do you have some kind of recruiting uh, mechanism where you're actually looking at you know, your survey, now that you know you've got so many that wanna do it, and you're kind of gonna narrow it down to the top, you know, the top performers and go from there. Are you doing something like that? Well, the I regional superintendents are definitely involved in this. Is this is one thing that we wanted to make certain that this was not something that became central office to where we were making these decisions um, in the office and push out. Um, because they are definitely um, close to this work and to, you know, to the school centers. So they've been a part of this process. They will definitely be a part of us in terms of drilling down um, to the selection of staff. Um, to your point, they are they're a part of it. Yeah, I just have to keep going a little bit, Mr. Barbieri, because some people may be more intermediate than primary, yep. and those things, you know, you may not know because you're looking at the certifications as elementary. So I would just hope that you have a, a robust recruitment piece where you have a team from each one of your regions working through that list. And some people may say they want to work, and then by the time summer rolls around and gets close, that you, you don't have what you thought you had. So you, you really need to start this process soon. And another piece, I love all the things that you're doing. I just wondered, you know, in the past, many times students didn't know they had to go to summer school until the end. It sounds like you're identifying students early and parents. Are you trying to educate the parents on what this is truly going to be all about for them? Do you have maybe a, a Q&A uh, portal where parents that are being uh, students of these uh, uh, parents of these students are being uh, identified so that you can kind of start letting them know this is what's going to happen. We don't want to wait until it's time. It's almost time as we speak. So what are you doing to make sure that parents know that they're going to have this opportunity? Kids know that they're already at risk and you've got all these numbers. It seems like a whole lot of people should be interfacing with you right now, not just with the school, but about this whole program and how their child's gonna fit this summer. What, what is it that you're doing? Do you have a portal or something where you're working back and forth? Well, we don't have a portal thus far. I mean, you know, we just did the press conference on, um, on last week um, to talk about um, what our summer plans were. And now that we have done, the, you know, in regards to what our summer plans were and we have updated the board and we're gauging your feedback, um, of course, we will work with communications and, and setting up some pieces in regards to how do we um, communicate and work with our stakeholders in understanding all these all these aspects of the program. Because you're right, it is a lot, and they're probably hearing us and we're putting it all on paper, but how do we drill down for them to understand um, the benefit, and most importantly, if their child has been targeted? Yeah. So I work with Mr. Oswald. In a, in a previous executive order, I wanna make it clear, we're required to make sure that we're providing monthly updates to our parents. So that is ongoing. Our schools have been working tirelessly to recruit and let parents know, especially those cool students who are struggling the most, that are, are, are not passing core courses. Um, and 
definitely are, are going to, and they're pretty excited about all these opportunities for their kids. So engaging the parents, and I think this is more of a very personalization piece with the school, is actually getting on the, uh, on the phone and making sure they're letting them know about the opportunity as well, Ms. Andrews, because you're right, they're part of this whole educational experience that we need to be reaching out to. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, I just noticed the time. We have a time certain meeting at five, and I have two more board members who want to ask questions. So if you don't mind, I can you know, call on Dr. Robinson. Dr. Robinson, would you watch the clock and give Mrs. McQuinn at least you know four or five minutes on hers also, or four minutes, please? Um, yes, I'll be happy to. Ms. Andrews indicates she has one more comment, if you don't mind. I don't want to cut yeah, her and, off. and just the VPK, that's a big one. And I know a lot of children wanted VPK, and maybe they had to go to uh, the uh, daycare centers and maybe they they use their voucher but for them to be able to kind of be in a school setting will you be including those people now if you don't have the answer right now you could get back with me but that's a real important component and i worry about that and yes we had jump start in the glade so we don't have it there anymore somebody help me with that one later dr robinson okay thank you um so first thank you for this presentation I think what makes me happiest is your focus on the foundational skills and the foundational years. Because, you know, years ago, we would only, like, we would look at the tested grades and nothing else. And so this is about um, educating children. So I'm pleased, really, really, really pleased with that. I want to follow up on a couple of comments I already made, and I'll try to be brief. Um, so I heard what you said about the numbers for the VPK hubs. So I'm going to put it out in the universe now. We need to partner with. ELC, CSC, uh, maybe the Education Foundation, because what we need to do is put some marketing materials together that speak to parents about the importance of early childhood education and pay people to go knock on doors in, in neighborhoods that have low penetration in terms of early childhood and have one-on-one -on -one conversations with parents to say why your baby needs to come to preschool, okay? So, and then we can build your the VPK hubs, but I'm putting that out in the universe and hope somebody else will pick it up and work with me on that. So the other thing is, so the elementary cluster sites, have they been determined? Because I think it says, it just says clusters. So do yes. you guys know where they are? Yes. So you can just follow up like with an email or whatever and tell us where? Yes. Um, and, to the board and then office. to follow up on Ms. Andrews' comment, in terms of having the best teachers working with the children that are so far behind, I would like to start with data, because I think we could still pull like the equivalent of PYG, right? And and start there and recruit those teachers um, to to work here. It's like, because certification means very little to me, uh, <laughs> and the highly effective rating means probably even less to me. And so I would I would like the data to speak to tell us who we should recruit to get working with the kids who are most needs. And then the last thing I'll say is, um, and just in terms of partnerships, so I know that each of you and the superintendent is aware of the partnership form with Palm Beach County Youth Services Department, and we actually had the presentation, and I want to thank, I'm, I'm not going to use up all Ms. McQuinn's time, but I want to thank um, Samika Satterwaith, Eileen Tyrado, and Brian Knowles for doing an outstanding presentation to the summer camps through, through youth services. 25 camps responded saying that even though they had not planned to do academic acceleration in their camp after those presentations, they said, we want to work with you. So we just need to work on what how that support um, is provided. And then lastly, I just want to say that there's other community groups who want to help. And so I guess at a later time, maybe one-on-one, -on -one, I want to talk about how we might be able to partner with the highly motivated and the willing um, to help support children who might not be coming into our programs. But thank you for this. Mrs. McQuinn. I very much appreciate the work that you have put into this and the timeliness. And so I'm going to start with the question, when do we come back again to address this? July. We'll come back in July for talk about phase two. Okay, great. So I will save one of my questions for July. Um, so <clears throat> um, I've been listening to the other comments, and I know we have five o'clock certain, but oh well. I agree with uh, Miss Andrews about, and, and also Dr. Robinson about identifying the teachers, and I've addressed that before with Dr. Sheffield. And so I will let that go, but know that that's 
hugely important who we put in front of the kids, particularly the kids who are, have not been successful. Also, I do support Dr. Robinson about being very proactive in recruiting our pre-K students for VPK, however I did that. Um, also, um, I'll save this one for later. Um, now let me come to the ones I initially thought of myself. Uh, Dr. Sheffield, you addressed the professional development component. You don't have to answer me now, but later. Will the, stu will the teachers get additional time and pay beyond what they've had in the past to prepare for their students? So will they know the students they're getting so that they can review their data and determine what they need? So aside from ELL or ESE, any student who participates would need an individual educational plan. And so I think the teachers who are instructing them certainly need time to prepare as we would have normally, but even more so. Will teachers get additional time and pay to at least weekly uh, talk about the students that they might have in common uh, and so to make adjustments as they need because four weeks is not a long time. Is there, um, is there a class size? I think there typically is for summer school. If not, there ought to be. And is it possible for our teachers to have the additional resource for this summer of Paris to help with this? Uh, you know where I'm coming with that. Should be able to find money for that for a month. And I'll let that go for now until we get to July. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McQuinn. I'm sorry that uh, I didn't notice sooner I would have tried to make more time for everybody. I have some questions, but I'm not going to go there. I'll talk to you all individually afterwards. We need a motion to adjourn this workshop. Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, seconded by Ms. Ayala. All in favor, opposed, motion carries. We'll resume in, in 5 o'clock, which is three minutes from now. <laughs>